So hello everyone, my name is Hugh McGuire. Um, I am the founder uh, and CEO of Pressbooks, which um, started out as an open book production platform and in the past number of years has really morphed into, I guess, one of the key technical platforms that um, open educational resources or OER are built upon. Um, so uh, what I'd like to talk about today, I'm hoping this is more of a discussion than a, a, a hardcore presentation. Um, but what I'd like to talk about is just frame a little bit what we see from our side at, at Pressbooks as we're thinking about OER. And I think it's particularly true in the universe we live in right now, uh, which is extraordinary for all of us um, and all of you. Uh, and all of the students who interact with uh, the content that, that um, all of us are involved in. Um, so I just want to set the stage a little bit with that, and then I'll pass the, the um, conch over to uh, Timothy Clark, um, who is instructional designer at uh, Mullingberg College, um, to talk about some of their experiences. And then uh, Michelle Reed is joining us from University of Texas Arlington to talk about what they've been doing and uh, challenges and experiences they've seen in the blending of OER, instructional design, and um, uh, OER instructional design and uh, library publishing more broadly. Um, so that's the framing I'm hoping, I'm just gonna uh, set the stage a little bit. I'm gonna pass it to Tim and then on to uh, Michelle. And hopefully that'll spur some questions and discussion that we can have later. Um, reminder to please uh, put any questions that you have during the event into the Q&A box. There's a little Q&A uh, icon at the bottom of your screen. Um, and uh, we will try to get to those in the discussion period. So there you go. That's a, a setup for things. As I say, I'm going to be try to be brief. Um, we've been working for many years helping to support largely the creation and now more the distribution of open educational resources. We have at Pressbooks um, more than 100 educational institutions around North America who are creating content and delivering to their students. And what that's meant is that there's now a network of all this stuff that's created uh, that is good quality OER that's available in the Pressbooks ecosystem, easy to pull in uh, uh, to your own Pressbooks system or to download in multiple formats to do with as you like. And I think we've seen, especially with the world of COVID that we're living in, the, the value that OER, uh, and particularly web accessible, web editable OER, can present as we have faculty all over the universe struggling to figure out how to teach online, how to get materials to their students. Uh, we certainly have what is likely to be a very difficult economic time for our students coming in the future. Um, if it's not already here already, um, OER obviously has the benefit of reducing cost for students. Um, but I think what we're seeing also is the flexibility and the openness to take OER, adapt it for different classroom contexts, different needs, is a very powerful um, additional tool in the tool set of instructors, faculty, administration, trying to grapple with this very strange time we find ourselves in. And I'm hoping that Tim and Michelle, who already had pretty robust OER programs um, before this could talk a little bit about how OER has changed the discussion about instructional design on their campuses and how they're finding OER is helping uh, or to the degree that it is helping or has provided um, uh, a solution or a set of solutions that make dealing with this current challenging time perhaps uh, somewhat easier. Um, I'm particularly interested as well in the connections between OER, um, the library and instructional design and how that ecosystem is starting to evolve and whether we're seeing increases in uh, the interest and the engagement um, from administration and faculty on figuring out how to better leverage OER. 
So that's really my introduction. I just wanted to set the stage for uh, people who are really on the ground doing the work to discuss and talk about um, and raise some ideas about how they've seen OER helping um, in their universes. And with that, I think, unless there's any question on, on the opening intro, I'd like to pass it to uh, Timothy Clark at Mullenberg College to talk about his experiences in his institution. And maybe, Timothy, I don't know if your slides uh, have this, but just maybe give a bit of context on, on your institution and, and um, what the sort of student makeup looks like when we dive into to the actual projects. And I think you've got slides, Tim, so um, over to you. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so yes, uh, Muhlenberg College is a uh, four-year, primarily residential, um, primarily undergraduate institution. We have a school of continuing education, and um, we have recently um, started our very first uh, graduate program uh, at Muhlenberg as well. Uh, we're in Allentown, Pennsylvania, in the Lehigh Valley. And uh, this is a picture of our library, Trexler Library. Um, uh, just a, uh, 60 seconds of background. In 2017, um, our uh, librarian, Jen Jarson, and Laura Taub, who's our Dean of Digital Learning, hosted a series of open education tech talks and invited Robin DeRosa to campus to engage with our faculty and administration. Um, and in 2018, our library directed Tina Hurdle and I joined the Pennsylvania Academic Library Consortium's Affordable Learning PA Initiative as the campus liaisons. Uh, we uh, attended some training and we came back imagining that our next big push would involve uh, encouraging faculty to adopt open textbooks and to learn how they might review them uh, and uh, contribute to them and adapt them. Uh, around the same time, we had uh, two faculty, um, uh, Professor Daniel Lysowitz and um, Professor um, Daniela Viale, uh, seek out a summer research opportunity to write an elementary Italian textbook, um, primarily from an affordability um, impulse, but um, also just to have uh, the textbook that they wanted to work with. And we selected the single book, press book, uh, as sort of our experimentation platform for housing and delivering the textbook, the uh, elementary Italian textbook that they wrote. Um, we had a summer uh, research assistant, a student who worked with them, uh, learned the, the Pressbooks platform and assisted in um, all matters, uh, trying to bring that book out of a series of shared Google documents um, into Pressbooks. Um, and we had such success with that project, that pilot, that we launched our Pressbooks EDU in 2019. Uh, over this academic year, we've had an open educational resources and open textbook learning community uh, comprised of faculty, staff, and student representatives, um, everyone receiving uh, the same stipend. And um, that has, I think, been tremendously successful uh, in that everyone came with a project in mind uh, we went through some workshops and the idea uh, before we departed campus was that we would check in um, in May uh, to see where everyone stood on their projects. I'd still like to do that um, at a distance. Um, so we'll, we'll bring that together once, uh, once grades are in. Uh, this is our small but mighty uh, Pressbooks instance, open.muhlenberg.pub slash catalog. Uh, we have five published textbooks and or five published books and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about all of those uh, very briefly. Uh, the first was um, the elementary Italian. There's now uh, elementary Italian two and an intermediate Italian one in the works as well. Uh, these have been very well received and um, are being used in uh, other institutions. So it's, um, it's everything we could have expected and a tremendous amount of credit goes to uh, professors uh, Lyswitz and Viale for, for sort of helping us uh, move in this direction. We also have um, from Dr. Lanithia Matthew Schultz, um, her class, uh, these are the student contributors, uh, 2018 political year of the woman election, a critical examination. This is a collection of political science articles um, that are thematic uh, in that they deal uh, with a particular uh, election and um, uh, Professor Matthew Schultz 
uh, sort of uh, stewarded this uh, semester long experience uh, from the students in her in her PSC 389 class. Um, and, and you should take a look. I think it's, it's really a remarkable uh, collection. Um, the thing about this that I think is really notable is just how quickly uh, something like this could, could come into being. Um, and uh, it's only through a platform of, or, or through, I guess, an open uh, publishing initiative. Uh, it was made especially easy um, uh, with press books and I can explain a little bit why it was so, uh, so perfect a fit for us at Muhlenberg in just a second as well. Um, this is Paris Through the Pages, uh, written by the French 427 uh, class at Muhlenberg College, uh, overseen um, by uh, Dr. Aline McEwen. Um, and these are written in French. Uh, they are chapter-based, and every student in the class produced the book as well as selected images um, and uh, to accompany the texts. And uh, lastly, um, Dr. Tinika de Hasslier's China's Magical Creatures and Where to Find Them, a student authored textbook that was published uh, most recently, uh, just within the last few weeks. Um, the motivation for this was that there is no textbook on China's magical creatures, so they had to, they had to write their own. Um, and uh, Dr. de Hasslier is in the process of working on a, a Korean history uh, textbook with her current class as well. So um, this is the, the screenshot I think that um, brings me the most joy. This is our uh, catalog record for uh, China's magical creatures and where to find them. We have an OCLC number. This is discoverable uh, in uh, WorldCat and uh, available through our uh, discovery layer, um, not only for our own students um, and uh, faculty, but for, for anyone uh, who might stumble across it in a search. And that, um, makes me really, really happy. Um, I also think it's important to point out that um, these, these student authors um, have, have credits in the content field. So uh, that's, that's a big deal, I think. Um, this is the website for our uh, learning community. Again, initially we imagined this was going to be a, a big push around um, open textbook adoption. But what we found was our faculty were really eager to imagine these um, uh, co-authorship or student authored books um, right from the outset and Pressbooks made that um, you know really really possible. We are a domain of one's own institution so many many of our students already have uh, a rich experience with WordPress uh, through creating e-portfolios and blogs and, and all sorts of other projects and so um, the leap from that experience into Pressbooks uh, for students, uh, we found was was a really, really simple uh, sort of transition. So um, here is the instructional design take on these kinds of uh, open educational projects or these um, open pedagogy projects. Um, they, at their core, are active and engaged. Um, this notion of proximal development um, and uh, the idea of uh, there is no better perspective on a complicated topic than someone who has just sort of learned it themselves. Um, student authorship of textbooks, I think, is, um, is really, really powerful and effective um, because they understand the voice and the, the, um, the, the method uh, for explaining um, these threshold concepts, right? Um, they're infused, these projects are infused with information literacy-based learning outcomes. Uh, both Tina Hurdle and I um, did a number of class visits where we would talk not only about press books being um, uh, open in terms of it being open source, but also uh, we uh, integrated um, Creative Commons licensing and um, just notions of uh, 21st century digital literacies, attribution, uh, crediting the work of others into the, the setup for the projects that the students then did over the course of the semester. I don't think that we should underestimate uh, the extent to which these are transferable skills. Um, the, the selection, evaluation, curation, uh, the fact that WordPress as a platform powers about 30% of all the websites in the world, uh, and that Pressbooks is very, very closely uh, aligned to, um, to an understanding of, of that platform. Um, and I think that uh, essentially, 
um, you know, this is an issue of critical digital pedagogy. Um, the fact that student expertise is valued and expected, uh, the sort of uh, flattening of the hierarchy between the, the teacher and the learner, um, I think is a really, really important uh, quality of, uh, of these kinds of uh, projects. And, um, oops, uh, I guess my key insight um, in wrapping up is that in all things collaborate with students. Uh, we have digital learning assistants at Muhlenberg College who understand uh, the Pressbooks platform. So if students are working on these projects, they have drop-in hours where they can, in a peer learning model, uh, engage with our learning assistants and complete their work. Um, we also have uh, uh, students that have been trained as Pressbook administrators um, that embed with a class that is uh, taking on one of these kinds of projects. Um, we, I mentioned the summer research opportunity. So we've had students work through the summer um, and uh, are, are compensated to assist faculty in either developing a uh, full cloth, a textbook, or um, uh, potentially adapting a, a significant adaptation of, a, of an open textbook that's out there. Um, and we had students as part of our, our learning community. Um, and I, I mean, I just wanted to put this down here for the record, you know, students as authors, students as editors, students as curators, and students as subject matter experts. I think these are all um, roles and uh, knowledge and skills that are uh, acquired uh, through uh, an activity like this in the class. So um, that's uh, what I have. This is my contact information. Um, that's my Twitter handle and my email. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy uh, to talk later. Thanks. All right, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Tim. Um, hey, you're doing, uh, we're doing really well on time. I wonder in the spirit of keeping this conversational, whether we wanna take that question from oh, yeah. Q&A now. That is a very good point. I, um, I've got it pulled up. Um, Tim, could you talk about how copyright issues affected publishing student work? Did someone give training to students on copyright and CC licensing so that they understood their rights? And finally, did they sign a publishing agreement? That's a great question, and I, I should have included that. Um, yes, so both. We, um, we did have in-class sessions where we talked about copyright and through the copyright conversation sort of segued into Creative Commons licensing and, and, and did a little bit of work with, with what those entail. And there was a, a, a memorandum of understanding basically between the instructor and the student in all of the cases. And most importantly, I think there was um, an alternative assignment available to any student who wanted to opt out. So um, thanks for that question. Um, I, I don't have the specifics. Most of that uh, work, the contractual work was done between the instructor and the students, but um, I can follow up if you like. Um, I'd also just in, in the Q&A, I pointed to a, a book that was produced by the Rebus community, uh, or not produced, but uh, coordinated by the Rebus community with a, a bunch of projects that had done work around uh, student created uh, content. Um, I think one of the beauties of OER is that these can be easily updated. And it seems to me, uh, Timothy, we should get a case study out of you to put in that book because it sounds like you did a lot of awesome work there. So um, the link is in, in the Q&A there. I can drop it in the main, uh, the main thing as well. But that's a, a cool little book with a lot of really great insights from some- and Tim, don't go away yet. You're getting follow-up questions. Uh, out of curiosity, Anita asks if any students opted out. Um, uh, don't hold me to this. I believe I remember there was a student who opted for a conventional term paper, um, and and uh, I can I can confirm that, but that's that's my recollection. Uh, but not many. Um, were there any major concerns from administrators or instructors on instructors on letting students take such a forward role on these projects? Uh, not that I'm aware of from our administration. Um, so. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I couldn't say that there were any, any major concerns. Um, I, I think there, I, I do remember there being support uh, for, for these projects um, in the way of our, um, our, our media office sort of promoting um, Dr. Matthew Schultz and her students' work around the uh, 2018 election. There was a write-up around that um, 
that class experience that incorporated an open book. Um, so that kind of support and encouragement, but I, I, I don't know of any concerns. And there's just one more right now. Um, how did you handle the handoff of a project from one student to the next when a new semester starts? Do you ever have gaps in the student workforce and how many students and staff are involved in an OER text? Right. Um, well, we, we don't have a, a digital learning assistance through the summer term or we have, we have had a, if we have, it's been a, a, a very sort of limited um, uh, time in which we have DLAs in the summer. Um, our digital learning assistant program um, is, is ongoing. So we're always um, in the fall recruiting our new, um, our new incoming group. Uh, so in that training, we cover Pressbooks whenever there's a class that has a Pressbooks project. Um, and I, I, I see that going forward really easily. Um, what was the last part of that question? I apologize. Sorry, too many buttons. And yeah. I also already marked it as answered. <laughs> uh, Go ahead. How many, uh, how many students and staff are involved in an OER text? Oh, okay. So we're, yeah, we're a small school and a small staff. So in, in the digital learning group, there's, there's four of us. Um, our DLAs, we usually have around eight or, or maybe 10 at the most. Um, and uh, uh, our library director and I have been uh, in partnership trying to support these, these few projects. We haven't really had, had that many. And I think I, I get the spirit of the question, you know, sustainability is definitely on our mind for these projects. Um, and we're in conversation about what that's going to look like going forward. But right now we're just sort of in that first push where we're, we're trying to, to grow and, and, and I, I think fairly soon we'll be having the, the next round of, uh, of meetings and conversations. Excellent. Okay. There, there's one more, uh, I'll just read this out myself if that's okay. Uh, Justin, which is, uh, someone who's, um, not a question, but a comment, but in all things collaborate with students. So quoting you, I don't think I have a question here, except why doesn't everyone think this way? Actually, maybe you can uh, answer that, Timothy. Um, I'm just fortunate. I think when I came into higher education, maybe I didn't think this way either, but um, I've, I've just sort of um, been raised in the culture of Muhlenberg College and, and that's one of the things that they really emphasize. So I agree, yeah. everyone should think that way. I'll just add my little comment on that. When Pressbooks started, it's been around, Pressbooks have been around for a long time, and it always seemed to me that education was a place where we would see it get embraced, and it took a while for the, uh, I guess in the startup universe, they call it product market fit or whatever you want, but uh, I remember, I recall it was a, a project at Radford College, I think, in Virginia, where a group had gotten together, I think it was creative writing, or maybe they had written essays about poetry and they actually printed the book and they did a, and they made an ebook and they did a presentation to the provost. And I just remember thinking what a amazing uh, uh, sort of use for press books that would be. So I think this idea of students as, as creators is, a, is a, just a very, very powerful concept. And I thank you, Timothy, for the awesome work you're doing at, at uh, Nuremberg. Um, Okay, so we're at uh, 4.30, and I think it's time to pass the torch over to Michelle Reed, uh, who probably needs no introduction, um, but Michelle runs the OER program at University of Texas Arlington, um, is a uh, force of nature, and I turn it over to Michelle to talk about her experience with OER and instructional design. Thanks, Hugh. Hi, everyone. I'm really happy to be here with you. I am the... I, well, at first I'm a, a new addition to this panel and I will say on the record that he was the only person on the planet that I would say yes to with a class like this coming in at the, just under the wire. Um, I want to start with a, a second warning. So that's my first, just to say, maybe I'm a little less than prepared for this, but we'll see how it goes. Um, the other warning I want to start with is that I am not in fact an instructional designer. I'm the Director of Open Educational Resources at the University of Texas at Arlington, where I've been for almost four years. Um, and though I'm not an instructional designer, I do have significant experience teaching my own classes, 
uh, developing curricula and also working with our, our a variety of faculty on um, course and assignment design. So a lot of that experience came from my prior position. I, before moving into open education, I worked at the University of Kansas Libraries as an undergraduate learning specialist. And in that role, I really got comfortable talking to faculty about their, their courses, um, about their expectations for students and about you know, where their students were at the moment and where they wanted to see them grow. Um, conversations about you know, assessment of course, uh, understanding the, the course content, just a lot of that work has been or, or was listening to faculty and asking a lot of questions. Um, it's also, I think, a willingness to think creatively and to problem solve with people, um, to, to be experimental sometimes. Um, and what that, that practice looked like was a lot of conversations about backwards design, um, a lot of talk about learning objectives, assignments and assessment, uh, and a, in a lot of cases, figuring out how to tell someone, a faculty member, in many cases, a very seasoned, uh, well-regarded faculty member, uh, that something just isn't going to go well for them. So I remember one conversation in particular, uh, someone had a, an assignment that was like a 15 page paper requiring 20 or so scholarly sources for a first year experience course. And I had to figure out how to tell this person, like, you're, in, you're in a world of hurt if, if you go down this path, um, you will regret it. So I, I've carried a lot of those, kind of that philosophy of how to do this work into my work at UTA, where I've had free reign to, to develop an open education program to meet our local needs. And uh, when I started this position, I was in the publishing unit. Um, we are our own department now. We're a very small department. But even though I started in publishing, my focus wasn't really on publishing. Um, our focus was really about creating learning experiences for students that will reduce those equity imbalances and allow more students to be successful. So um, I'm just very quickly going, I don't even know what time I started talking. Um, I'm going to quickly talk through three points and then hopefully we'll have lots of additional time for uh, discussion. So the first thing is connected to sustainability and consulting. And um, again, we're a really small department. Uh, it is me and two student workers who work about 15 hours a week. Um, but we've been able to accomplish a significant amount in a relatively short period of time. Uh, and I think a lot of that is due to what I call lateral oversight. So we have a lot of people involved um, within the libraries and across the institution in our open initiatives. And uh, so some of that is, all of it for me is teaching and a huge focus on educating my peers, um, educating my supervisor and educating university administration about what all of this stuff uh, means and why it's important. Um, so early on, I started investing in training our liaison librarians to be able to do OER consultations. And again, this is connected to those uh, experiences that I would have as an undergraduate learning specialist, just asking people questions and trying to figure out what works for them and what doesn't. So uh, teaching our other librarians as well as our course reserve staff to ask questions like, what do you want your students to learn in this class? And what resources do you use that support that learning? And what works well and what doesn't? And um, in what ways do you want this to grow so you can do and your students can accomplish new, uh, new things? So um, this has also growing our, our capacity and uh, you know, thinking about sustainability long term has also meant bringing our actual instructional designers into the conversation very early on. So they are one aware that we are a service on campus and know the kinds of uh, support that we can provide. Um, but also seeking out conversations with them and, and figuring out what it is that they do going into their space um, and, and really focusing on our shared mission and shared objectives so that we can uh, work together more efficiently and collaboratively. 
Um, in fact, our first, uh, I will post this, so many windows open. Uh, our very first OER published by Mavzip and Press, um, and that is the publishing arm of the, the libraries. We do a, a separate unit does open access journals. Uh, my unit does open educational resources. Uh, just drop this link, but the very first thing we published was a book on creating online learning experiences written by one of the instructional designers on our campus. So um, I think that kind of consulting model can work really well um, for OER initiatives. The second thing I wanted to talk about was connected to accessibility and um, just recognizing that most of us aren't good at, at understanding or even thinking about accessibility. Um, our faculty and our, our institutions more broadly really need help in this regard. Um, most of us are not trained to create accessible material. And so for us locally, that's meant investing our own time, teaching ourselves um, so that we can teach our faculty how to create resources that are going to, to work for everyone. And we, we certainly are not perfect in any way, um, but we are much better than we would Thanks you. Uh, much better than we would be if we were not being intentional about centering our students and thinking about students who may have different physical or learning needs um, than and, and just not, you know, completely disregarding large populations of our student populations uh, because we don't understand what those needs are. And a, a third piece of this has really been finding partners who can help us be successful in this. And so one of our partners who's helped us been successful is Pressbooks. We use Pressbooks for creating and disseminating our OER. Um, and there's a lot of tools and features that are built into the platform that kind of act as a prompt and a reminder for us to, to think about things like alt text um, and how our links work and various and headers and all of that, that kind of stuff. Um, the third thing, I <laughs> just was typing some notes up and I just typed learning and then that was it. So who knows? Uh, learning is important. Uh, the third thing I wanted to talk about, we, in all of these consultations, um, particularly in STEM, one of the, the things that I hear about a lot is that need for personalization and for um, automating feedback. So very quick feedback to students. Students, of course, appreciate that as well. Um, but it's not that easy of a, a solution. I, so I think for those of us who are um, supporting OER and advocating for the use of affordable resources on our campus, it's important for us to act as a conduit between our faculty, our students, and our administration to identify problems and to recommend solutions that are going to help everyone succeed. And so I think that means staying very student centered, being student focused, um, and looking for ways to involve students in that conversation. So going back to this idea of collaborating with students always, there's lots of ways to collaborate with students beyond inviting them to be contributors to a text, so that's an, an incredibly exciting um, approach to collaborating with students. But um, building in feedback loops, working with student government, um, going out and just having conversations with students about how their courses are going, uh, the resources that they're using, if they're purchasing access to these resources, and if not, you know, what are their strategies for success? What are their levels of concern? How does it impact them? Um, all of those things can be incredibly beneficial to help scale and grow our open education efforts. So um, I'm just, I'm gonna leave it there. I don't know how much time I took, but good, good enough. All right. Um, excellent, thank you, Michelle. So uh, there's no uh, lined up questions in the Q&A, but I think I'll ask you and then Timothy the same question, um, which is, with uh, the universe we live in right now, to what degree has that um, opened eyes to the uh, value of OER more so than it was there otherwise? And I might talk about faculty, students, and administration, whether this moment that we're living through right now has, has um, uh, 
uh, has raised sort of the esteem or the value that people see OER with right now or, or not, which is possible as well. I'll, I'll start with you, Michelle, on, on that question. So I get, I get questions. I, I started receiving questions about whether our consultations for OER have grown in the last few weeks, and they haven't. And I think um, kind of across the board nationally, they haven't. And I think that's just because we're in an emergency situation and everyone's trying to survive and looking to learn something new isn't beyond all of the, the new things that we are forced to learn, like how to use the LMS and how to use Microsoft Teams or whatever other technology is being thrown at people. Um, but I do anticipate that that will grow significantly over the summer. We're seeing, um, a lot more interest in things like Z degree programs that can be used for uh, recruiting and enrollment purposes. Um, of course, there's the student success angle and learning and all of that too, but there is some interest in how we could develop a very, develop that kind of program systematically so that we can start um, marketing it as uh, one of the benefits of enrolling at, at the University of Texas Arlington. Um, I have received feedback from people who are already using OER that this has been, that the use of the text has made the transition a lot more smooth than they expected it to be otherwise. Um, and then we're also seeing, not so much from faculty, but definitely from administration, some interest in really growing the use of OER. Um, Timothy, how about you at, at uh, your institution has, has uh, again, this strange moment that we're in, raise the profile of OER at all? Yeah, um, I, think, I think I'm think i a little bit in a wait and see sort of a mode as well, but the one piece of um, sort of anecdotal feedback that I got was um, we have uh, a member of our language faculty who is really tightly integrated H5P interactive components into um, her Canvas course and um, where other language courses may have um, needed to really reimagine quickly um, what learning at a distance was going to look like in this moment. I think that she was able to make that transition much more quickly and the student experience was, was pretty positive. You know, um, what I'm hearing from students is that they're spending a lot of time right like this in Zoom and um, thinking about a kind of synchronous delivery of, of their course content where um, those who I think have um, done some thinking around their course design that incorporates various kinds of OERs um, might be a little more agile in this in this particular moment than otherwise. If I can jump in one more time, um, we've also had, like many people, I'm sure if there's a uh, technology shortage with many libraries and computer labs closing. Um, we know that all of our students don't have access to technology. We know all of our students don't have access to Wi-Fi. And so um, OER has really allowed us to meet students' needs regardless of what their personal, you know, technical infrastructure is. So, you know, we have options to make hard copies available. We have options for students to download content and then access it whenever they're not connected to the internet. So I think um, there's, there's a lot of focus with commercial publishing in particular on it, digital only and these kind of subscription or uh, streaming models. But OER gives us a lot more flexibility and allows us to meet a, a wider um, range of student needs. And I think that's a, a really important point for us to focus on as we continue to have these conversations with administrators about how OER can benefit our campus. 